Alrighty, welcome back to another video. So today I'm going to be doing a warrior card tier list in Across the Obelisk. Um, just to give a little bit of context if you're not familiar with me, um, I play pretty much exclusively random hero runs on Obelisk Challenge Madness 10. Um, so I'm going to be judging all of the cards from that perspective. And what that generally means is a couple of things here. Um, for an Obelisk Challenge, generally the hardest act in Obelisk Challenge is Act 1, like the first act of the game. The first, like, sort of uh, map. Um, so there's going to be a skew towards and bias towards cards that um, allow you to be successful in the first act. Um, and then cards that are generally later game cards, cards that scaling, that are uh, have scaling or require scaling are going to be probably a little bit further down the list because, um, yeah, generally... Um, if you get good items, your your cards actually don't matter too much in terms of scaling. Um, the other thing, of course, is there are plenty of cards in Obelisk Challenge which are quite good. Um, some of them are actually top tier. That if you're an adventure-only player, or you've mainly been focusing on adventure, they're probably not going to be cards that you're maybe not expecting, because honestly, uh, the Obelisk Challenge meta is very wide and varied. Um, there's a lot of cards that are sort of available in the draft, and then we have this random pack in the draft, which means you can get any card in the game potentially before you even start the run, um, which has some sort of interesting um, sort of impacts on the way to think about things. Um, the third thing I want to bring out just quickly is that I'll quickly talk about like the tiers here. So yeah, I'm not doing like S, A, B, C, D tier, that kind of thing, because I think it's kind of hard to judge cards by their raw power because a lot of cards in the game are just sort of situational. Um, some cards, like, you know, they need a lot of other things to go right to work. Some cards are sort of reliant on having other team members or specific compositions to be powerful. Um, so instead of, like, trying to rate cards purely on their strength, I'm trying to go with the idea of what cards are core. You know, and cards that generally you're going to be picking and seeing very often in your runs. Versus cards that are, you know, sort of more niche. They generally are only played in specific circumstances, etc. And then cards in the extremely niche tier are, are probably just cards that don't really do very much or are not very relevant. Um, and yeah, and I guess the last thing as well is that I'm going to try and judge these cards generally... Um, without worrying about other characters. So we're going to try and assume that this character is trying to be self-sufficient up until a point. Because um, like, in the way I play the game with random heroes, you have no guarantee whatsoever that who any of your teammates are going to be. Like your comp is completely random. You can have no healer. You can have no scouts. You can have triple warrior, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, we're going to be sort of making the assumption that we have no idea who the other heroes are. And that will make so we're sort of trying to judge the card in and of itself and how it works within the warrior class. <laughs> Hot takes incoming, exactly. Alrighty, so we're gonna get us started then. It's enough rabbiting and ranting on for me. The first card that we're gonna be going through, and we're gonna go through them all in alphabetical order, is Arsenal. Um, and I'm gonna be playing Arsenal. Honestly, it's between these two tiers. I'm probably just gonna put a niche tier. Um, I don't really think Arsenal is impactful a lot of the time. Mainly because it's a very slow card, um, very slow tempo wise. Like you, if for example, like if you have the unupgraded version, you spend four energy and it doesn't actually do anything for you on that turn. You get the energy and the investment back in later turns. Um, and the general Obelisk Challenge Mare is to kill enemies as fast as possible. So you want your, your turns to be impactful and your energy spent to be impactful on the turn that you get it. Um, it's also the case that the cards you get in Arsenal are just not that good. Um, there's a lot of sort of poor warrior attacks that you're often going to be getting from the card. Um, so yeah, oftentimes it's just sort of underwhelming. It's sort of weird, the worse your deck is, the better Arsenal is, because you can get better cards than your bad deck. But if you have a really good deck, Arsenal just sort of objectively makes your deck worse. Um, so I'm going to be putting it in Nisha now, because if you get lucky, there is some good upsides to it. Uh, but overall, it's kind of poor. Alright, so next up, we have Barbed Wire. Um, so Barbed Wire is available to draft in the Waller pack. Um, and I'm also going to be putting this into Niche tier. Um, the main reason behind it being in Niche tier is it just doesn't do very much. You know, by itself, if you take plus one thorns, um, the plus one thorns start at the end of the draft, it applies two or three 
spawns to your entire team, which is just not very much, honestly. The card can be okay and a bit more impactful if you are lucky and find a good amount of plus spawns in your items, which there are quite a few of. Um, but overall, most of the time this doesn't do very much. It's sort of biggest highlight is that it's oftentimes a zero cost skill that Breed can use to proc Command and Conquer and Defensive Strategy. Next that we have is Barricade. And Barricade is going straight into the call, call tier. Because, you know, Barricade is exactly the kind of card we want on our frontline tanks, on our warriors. If you're playing a warrior as a tank, in my opinion, the most fundamental thing that tanks provide um, on warrior tanks specifically pride over any other frontliner is their ability to AoE block. You generally don't need to focus on um, blocking for yourself because you have way higher health and resistances by default than other classes. So like self-blocking is generally something that's not that important in my experience, but like your ability to keep your whole team safe and the whole team alive um, is sort of like the best benefit to having um, a warrior tank in any team. Um, and Barricade is just a very good card that does that. It's good early game, you know, it's going to be like 11 block by default. Um, you can get it discount to just a single energy cost once you hit level 3. It's relevant throughout the entire game, um, and it's just a very good pickup. Um, and if I didn't mention, this can appear in the Defender pack, and it's also a Magnus starting card, so Magnus oftentimes will see two Barricades, and if you've got two Barricades on your tank Magnus, you're feeling pretty good. Alright, next card is Battle Plan. So Battle Plan, I'm going to be putting Battle Plan also into the core tier. I think Battle Plan is just like a fantastic card. It's energy neutral over two turns. It, it's not technically draw neutral because like you put the cards back on two cards back onto the deck, but it does allow you to dig. Um, and it's a great card to just sort of ensure that you get a lot more consistency out of the deck. You find the big cards you want to find, you find important enchantments and get into play early. Um, so like you're saying things like defensive strategy, um, steel forge from Heine, etc. Um, or even just finding impactful cards you want to play like Entrench or Barricade. Um, yeah, it's really good for that. It's honestly not too bad uh, even on offensive warriors, although drawing cards does mean that if you have something like offensive mastery, which would reduce the cost of those attacks, you won't actually get the cost reduction. But overall, very solid card. Um, and you pretty much always want to be seeing one of these. Um, or if you do see one of these, you're always probably pretty excited to put at least one copy into your deck, especially on Tank Warriors. Alright, so next up... Battle Shout. And he gets to this one. Also Cortia, all the BA cards, all in Cortia. My Battle Shout is absolutely crazy. Extremely strong card. Giving, you know, four or five powerful to your entire team is so impactful. Um, it just makes every, you know, the rest of the fight so much easier because you're dealing so much extra damage with your carries. You know, the reinforce is really nice in specific situations to keep your team safe if you don't have a lot of block. For Bree specifically, it's a skill, so it procs all the things she wants with that. She gets a discount. All of her right side tree just basically interacts with this and makes it nice. And then as well, you also get um, a little bit of Vitality, which if you find some plus Vitality items and take the plus Vitality perk, it actually turns out to be a really reasonable source of healing. Um, it can definitely still be good for healing a little bit of chip damage in the early game, um, which will keep your team sort of healthy, especially if you don't have a healer. Like, Battle Shot is an absolutely core card on uh, Bree especially, support tank Bree, and even other tanks. Even the three cost is still justified for those other tanks as well. Next up. Blazestorm. Blazestorm is a little bit of a difficult one. Blazestorm is going to be sort of where I think we probably want to put it. It's probably in one of these two tiers, either niche or situational. Blazestorm has the issue that the majority of melee attacks do, whereas there's only a single upgrade that is actually allows you to target anything you want, and most upgrades just allow you to hit the front monster. And generally, you, that is something that makes the card's extremely bad. Um, so I'm going to be cutting it into niche tier because if you get the white or the blue upgrade, it's just, you know, the, the card's just sort of unplayable a lot of the time. Like hitting the guy at the front is almost never what you want to do. You need to be focusing down high priority backline targets. Um, so it goes into niche tier because if you can manage to find the yellow upgrade and you do get to hit what you want, it's, it's a reasonable card. It does okay damage. It definitely needs some sharp, bless, or other kind of scaling to really make it do a lot. But it does a reasonable amount of damage initially. 
Um, but it's it's never like a super impactful card unless you get some crazy scaling piece. Um, so I'm gonna put it in niche um, overall. Okay, next up, bleed out. It's a bit difficult to rate this card. I, it's it's very very impactful when you're running a bleed build, but like bleed builds in general are quite bad. <laughs> They're very hard to make work. Grickly is the best candidate for a bleed build. He has some good bleed perks, um, but even then, unless you find a good density of bleed cards and items and have Grickly, this card is generally not going to be used. So it goes in niche tier because like it's generally not a card you're going to see very often. Bleed, I think bleed builds are some of the worst builds you can do in in a, in, in in general. Um, I'd much rather build Grickly towards fury and damage over a bleed. Um, so yeah, so it goes here, but like it is probably like, it is a very good late game scaling card for bleed. If you can get two or three bleed outs, um, and a decent enough amount of bleed stacks initially, you will just like win any fight. So it's not like the card is like bad by itself, it's just that bleed is a very niche uh, damage type and way to play the game in Noblest Challenge right now in my opinion. Okay, Bloodbath. This is a very similar situation. It's another scaling bleed bleed card. So scales based on your your bleeding. Um, those bleed out and bloodbath actually work together really well. But for the exact same reasons, it's going to be a niche card because bleeding is just not particularly great. Okay, next up, blood feeding. I'm actually going to be putting blood feeding into the generally strong category. It's actually very impactful having a one-to-one -one heal with bleed on enemies. Um, it's very easy to maybe get like 20, 10, 20, 30 bleed in, onto a target in the early game. That's not like completely unreasonable and then you just heal like 20 or 30 health. Um, it's very strong honestly. I've had a few runs where I've not had a healer and I'm able to keep um, key warriors alive or like Grookly etc like alive by just having a blood feeding available and it healing me for a bunch um in multiple fights i do think this yellow upgrade is a little worse than the other two the other versions uh mainly because it dispels the bleed so oftentimes you can't kill them with the card because it actually doesn't do very much damage and the healing becomes a lot less worth it if you give the enemy another turn if the bleed would otherwise kill them Hey, the follow-up question. You mentioned with Blaze Song, but the other cards changed here based on the upgrade. Yes. The, the problem with melee attacks is like three quarters of them have a single upgrade that allows you to hit any enemy that you want. And the other and the base card and the other upgrade that allows you to hit front monster. And the difference between hitting any enemy you want and hitting front monster is like it's insane. It's so much like only being able to hit the front monster just kills so many cards viability. It's, it's it just makes them really bad. Like front monsters are generally super resistant to physical damage anyway, and you want to be killing important backline enemies like dryads and elite enemies like you know whatever. Most elites are sort of backliners, so it's generally just you just don't really have a good time with hitting front monster. Yeah, I don't know. That's just the way the cards are, and because in Noblest Challenge we don't get free upgrades. Or rather, we don't get a lot of opportunities to upgrade our cards. Upgrades are very expensive because there's no discounts. Um, unless you like find an altar and hit a, a card, you know, whatever those checks are called. The percentage roll higher than fat 6 or whatever it is. So you don't really get a lot of choice to upgrade them. Which means that, yeah, these cards that are sometimes front monster but could be upgraded to be any monster, it just gets stuck being front monster. So that's why they get rated down a lot. Blood of Blood is up next. I'm also going to be putting this card in generally strong. Um, it's a really decent early game option. It is a good card, actually. I just talked about how front monster attacks are generally not great. This one is a, it's a very low cost, low investment front monster attack when it's unupgraded. And it does, if you have a decent amount of self bleed on, you just end up adding 20, 30 damage. Per turn against an enemy. Um, both of the upgrades are very good because they both allow you to target anything um, and then they scale really well if you're self bleed. And if you're playing Grookly, who this card is mainly going to be used for, um, it's definitely going. Um, these are You're always going to get good value out of Blood for Blood. Um, maybe in the late game the card falls off, maybe you want to take something like the armor that makes you immune to bleeding. I've forgotten his name right now. 
Um, in which case, obviously, self bleeding becomes a non issue, or maybe you end up with like overwhelming amounts of dispel, where your self bleeding never really becomes a problem. Alrighty, so next up, we have Blood Rage. Blood Rage, I'm gonna be putting this also into the generally strong category. I do think that exchanging your health for energy is like insanely good. Like, there's nothing wrong with that concept. The only reason why this is not a call card is just sometimes you don't have a healer in your composition and you have no way to heal. And it is actually kind of punishing to lose somewhere between 12 and 20 health every single fight. You know, you're talking four or five or six fight per act. Um, you're losing like somewhere between like 50 and 100 health just from Blood Rage. Um, but that's the only reason why if, if you're if you were always play comps with healers, this is an absolutely call card. You should always be taking it. Like, getting 2 energy for, for 12 or 16 or 20 health is insanely good value. But Bludgeon, moving on to Bludgeon. Um, you gotta be putting Bludgeon into the generally strong category. Um, Bludgeon has no targeting restrictions. You can hit any enemy, enemy you want with it. Um, I do think, unfortunately, it is. Crack is... I mean, we just talked about how Bleed is a bit underwhelming. Crack is probably the other sort of meta strategy or a, a damage strategy that is also very underwhelming in Obelisk Challenge. It's very hard to stack enough Crack um, to make Blunt cards like this super relevant. It is a great way to stack Crack, but like by default, you're going to have plus one Crack charges, which means that using a Bludgeon gives six Crack. It's only six, which is like not quite enough crack uh, for it to be super relevant. You need probably to get into the realms of like 20 plus for to start seeing really, really um, big numbers. So it is it is definitely probably one of the better blunt slash crack cards, but just because blunt and crack is underwhelming, um, I'm going to put it in generally strong and not into core. All right, so next up, we have Bouncing Shield. Um, bouncing Shield. I mean, I guess I'll put it in niche tier. Like, <laughs> I don't really know what this honestly. I've never really ran many block block transfer to damage builds. Um, this is sort of maybe like the premium cards you have to do huge amounts of damage with by stacking block. Um, but those that that playstyle requires so many different pieces, so many different cards to come together. You need to hit like. Um, multiple ways to, to stack your block up really high. Um, you know, like the card that duplicate doubles and triples it. God, I'm forgetting all the names of everything. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and yeah, and then if if you don't have that, the card basically does nothing. Right? If you don't have high amounts of block, it deals a marginal amount of damage for 5 energy. Um, and then it gets rid of your block. And like, I think... The game is, you get roughly about like 9 or 10 damage per energy um, and for most other cards. So you need at least 50 block um, to make this card good. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just a very, very niche niche uh, build in Obelisk Challenge in general. And so pretty much all the cards that deal damage based on your block are going to be niche cards. Okay, we're going to move on to Burning Blood now. Um, Burning Blood? I haven't really played with this card very much. It's sort of a very weird card, to be honest. It's sort of a way to scale your fury. Um, but you do it by self-bleeding? I don't know. The card's just very strange. Um, you change your bleed into burn, which sometimes is worse than bleed, because with enough burn you hit negative resistances and it does more damage to you than the bleed does. Um, this one does cut it in half, which is kind of nice. I don't know, I just feel like this card is a bit weird. It's sort of like, if you can somehow get insane amounts of self-bleed, you can turn it into burn and gain a bunch of fury, but like, to get insane amounts of self-bleed, you need to already have a bunch of fury, and if you have a bunch of fury, you generally are already winning the fights. So it's a bit more of a, it's a, feels like a little bit of a win more card. Like, if you're in a position where you're already winning, it's, it's good. Um, but it doesn't really do much for you if you don't have Fury, and it doesn't really do that much if you don't actually have a good way to generate Fury in the first place, which 
Um, honestly, it's probably more of the concern for playing like Grookly. Um, you actually need to find a Fury Generator, something like um, Berserker, glo Gauntless Gloves, wherever they're called. Um, you know, or finding cards that generate Fury. Or so yeah. So I think overall, it's it's kind of niche, and it might even be extremely niche, honestly. Um, but I haven't really played the, around with the card very much, so I don't want to make too many judgments on it. Alright, so next up we have Butchering. So I'm going to put Butchering into the situational tier. Um, I think generally Butchering is kind of decent. Um, it's a good early game card. The, the randomness is definitely not ideal. Um, you can definitely hit the wrong targets, but... Um, yeah, if you have either the upgrades especially, like this one's like... You deal 16 and apply 20 for bleed. So you're dealing 40 damage for in one turn for 3 energy, and then it's another um, bunch more damage, another 23, so another 22 damage the next turn if the targets are not dead. So it actually has some decent long-term value. Um, and then obviously if you do manage to get the yellow upgrade, you can target specifically the enemy you want to hit this with, um, which is very, very, very good. Um, I do think overall the butchering generally falls off later in the game unless you have a bleed build setup. Um, but like considering how we're gonna rate a lot of the other warrior attacks, this one is actually probably one of the better ones overall. Okay, next up is Carnage. And for Carnage, I'm gonna be putting Carnage into the niche tier. <laughs> Which I know some people are going to be like, what the heck? Are you serious? The reason why Carnage goes into the niche tier for me is it is a card that is 100% reliant on having a scaling mechanism. If you don't have sharp, and it's not just any scaling mechanism, it's very, very much you need to have a flat damage scaling mechanism, which means you need sharp or bless. Right, if you don't have a sharp generating engine, or you don't have a blessed generating engine, Carnage does very little. It's random hit monster, so it's extremely inconsistent. Um, and it just doesn't do very much. You know, it's it's sort of worse than Butchering um, if you have no scaling whatsoever. And it's even worse than cards like Rampage, to be honest. Um, if you do get scaling and you do find flat scaling, this card is absolutely insane. It is one of the strongest late game cards you'll ever you, you can play. And it's cheap. So you can get multiple of them, you can play it multiple times if you have things like repetition training. It this card gets stupidly strong. Um Yellow is okay as a vulnerable card. Yeah, I, I a general issue again is just the randomness. Sometimes you end up playing applying two vulnerable to two different enemies, and then sometimes they, it just wears off because they get to take their turns. This logic makes a lot of very little sense. Uh, okay, give it to me, Otaku. We got, you've got to consider that the most important thing in Ob Obelisk Challenge is to get through Act 1. Blood for Blood is niche. I'm so... It does nothing without bleed. Yeah, but Grookly is, is always going to have self-bleed. The guy literally generates fury every turn. And like cards like Barricade and Battle Shout are cards we want to play. You know, if I could play a Battle Shout every single turn, then, you know, I would. Like that card is so crazy impactful. <laughs> okay, let me let me explain. Let me explain this, right? There, there will be runs and you've got to understand, right, this, I'm fully judging the cards here based on full random heroes. No guarantees on any hero compositions. Um, or anything like that. Like, you will go through runs, full random hero runs with Grickly or whoever DPS warrior you want to run with Carnage. You will not find a single sharp card, you will have no bless available, and you will play Carnage and it will do very little damage. And it will be very unimpactful. It's very bad in Act 1, which is the most important act for us to, do, to be strong in, because it's by far the hardest act in the game. Whereas Blood for Blood, I'm trying to say that it is impactful on Grickly. Whereas Carnage is not impactful, potentially, on any character if you don't find a scaling mechanism. So, challenging Shout. 
Um, I'm not really sure about this card, honestly. It might just be a situational card. It might be a niche card. I think it's like... It sort of depends on the character. Um, on Heiner, this is probably it's very good because having two turns of Taunt with Steel Forge is solid. Although, maybe you don't want to be hit with every single attack when you have Steel Forge and make it run out too fast. Um, on Bree, if you have Thorns build, it's decent, but it's not incredible. It's sort of in between these two tiers. It is very expensive for what it does. Um, you can get some discounts on it. I believe it is both a defense and a skill, so... Pretty much every defensive tank warrior can get a discount. Um, I don't. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think I'm gonna put it into niche. Um, mitigate is is powerful. The mitigate is very strong. Um, I'm gonna put it in niche only because I do generally think that warrior generally in obelisk challenge. Your frontline warrior doesn't need to block that much more than the rest of the team. Um, it sort of does depend on the enemies you end up facing. Um, but you don't need like four you or five times as much block as like, you know, the rest of it. It's much generally better to just be able to AoE block for the whole team than it is to just block selfishly for yourself. Obviously, the taunt here means that you are going to be taking a lot more of the damage intended for the other people. So, I think overall, it's, like, decent. You're very rare, un unlikely to even see it in the first place because it's a mythic card. Maybe it should be in situational. It's, it's between one of those tiers for sure, but I'll just put it in niche for now. Alright, change weapon. Change weapon's a bit of an interesting one, I think. Um, I think my biggest problem, what I don't like about change weapon is uh, that if you have, um, once you hit level 3 on like Rookie and Magnus, and you have Offense Mastery, Change Weapon costs you an energy. Because you switch out a discounted card um, and replace it with a, a card that doesn't have a discount anymore. Um, sometimes it's worth it, and sometimes it's not. Um, I'm going to put it into niche tier. I think in Adventure this card is, is probably insanely good, because getting like the very specific uh attack that you want to play consistently uh things like if you want to like imply a vulnerable or you want to be hitting like a big we were just talked about carnage big carnage or something probably makes it very strong um and all this challenge you generally don't or you're not going to be trying to play around a single attack i think like the best case scenario for something like change weapon is to try to fish for like a titanfall um or a mortal strike maybe um to try and get like a really big damage card out on an early turn or earlier in the turn um, obviously, that means assuming that you have you draw a change weapon early. You can also draw a change weapon late into a draw, into a, a sort of rotation of your hand, and then change weapon is um, obviously a lot less useful there because you might not even have something left in your draw pile that you even want to draw. So then the card is just a dead card. It isn't just for finding attacks. It thins your deck, removes attacks from draw pile and cycle. That's true. That's true. I guess from that point of view, it is. Uh, it does help. Um, if you wanna, if you do wanna cycle your deck more quickly, um, it sort of gives you two fewer cards in your deck itself. All right, next card, charge. I'm sorry, charge. I don't know why. Oh, I do know why. I can't unfortunately make the other cards not show up, but <laughs> charge is extremely niche. Jeremy, because the card is just kind of bad. I don't want to be mean to the card, but it's kind of bad. <laughs> it only hits front monster. You know, most of the time you're only getting one fast base, maybe two fast, which doesn't do very much. Because you have to have taken your turn to gain fast, which means that if you're slow, it's it sort of doesn't help that much. One of the versions is innate, which is you, the last thing you want to do. The last thing you want to do is draw a charge on turn one, I think. I think, like, the majority of the cards <laughs> in the game are stronger, so yeah, it's just it's just not not a great time, unfortunately. Um, I don't know. I, I don't really have anything good to say about the card, unfortunately, so... Yeah, I think if it had, like, one more fast on every version, it would at least maybe have some utility. It wouldn't be, like, 
crazy good, but at least you'd be able to move up, you know, you could... Getting three fast on yourself is actually quite good. Okay, Citadel. Citadel goes into niche tier for me. And it's not that Citadel isn't strong, because Citadel is obviously insanely good if you can play it. There's, there's two problems with Citadel. One, you need to be able to play it. And if you have the luxury of waiting for nine energy, um, then, you know, you probably already won the run. So it's a bit weird more. And, like, obviously there's, like, good synergies with, like, Last Stand, for example. If you can get the Last Stand that makes it cost zero, obviously Citadel becomes, like, an insanely good pickup at that point. But, like, there's no way you can really guarantee a Last Stand in Obelisk Challenge. So, it just turns out this Citadel's cool. This, the sound effect is definitely good. The sound effect is cool. Um, but, yeah, I think... And and it's not that you can't make Citadel work. You can find the Citadel in um, like the random pack and have it from the start of the game, and you can make Citadel work, and it'll be really strong. But it's you know, it it doesn't mean that the card is like um, sort of incredible in all situations, and the energy cost is just very painful. All right, next up, Cleave. So I I don't know what's up for Cleave exactly. Cleave goes in one of these two tiers. I guess we'll put it in situational. The thing about Cleave is it does hit every enemy, which does mean it always hits the enemy you want to hit, but it just doesn't do very much damage. Like, base card is 5 plus 1, 6 damage to all enemies for 2 energy, which unfortunately just doesn't do very much. So the fact that it does allow you to hit some, like, whoever you want can sometimes be useful, and, you know, it can hit stealth enemies, um, and it can be good for finishing off low health and then applying some extra damage to everyone else. Yeah, feel free to lambast me in the comments if you think that I'm a terrible human being for raiding Carnage's niche. Get in there. Alright, Code of Arms. I'm going to put Code of Arms into the situational um, here. Yeah, so Code of Arms is going to put in situational. I think Code of Arms is about... It's probably one of the best self-block cards you can get that isn't overkill. It's sort of like at a decent level where, especially this yellow upgrade, Dispelling Vulnerable and Applying Fortify is very impactful actually. It's actually very solid. Unfortunately, we don't see, you know, because of all those challenge things, we're not always going to see the yellow version of the card. But we may be stuck with these other versions. They're still good. Reinforce is definitely not like the worst stat to, to apply to the Frontliner, assuming that you're using this on a Frontliner. Um, so yeah, I think that like Coat Arms can be good. I feel like a lot of the time um, I will skip over a Coat of Arms because I just don't feel like I need that much block on my frontliner. And then there's also things like it's technically not great to have against like Archon if you see that boss, although it's only a 1 in 5 chance now because um, you don't want to be over blocking. Um, but generally, yeah, I think if you are in a situation where you feel like your frontliner needs more block, this card is very good for that. Um, otherwise it's probably going to be skipped over a bit, so that's why I'm putting it in situational. Alright, so next up, Colossal Blow. Colossal Blow, it just goes niche, I think. Like, the idea of, like, purging Reinforce, I think, is actually really cool. It's just very hard to, like, make work in practice in my eyes. There's a whole problem again where, like, you want specifically the blue the blue upgrade, because then it allows you to hit Reinforce on any target you want. And yeah, like, like, <laughs> like Attacker said, it's not really a, a great source of powerful, getting one or, you know, maybe you have plus one charges, so two or three, it's not that great for a card, but then it costs so much energy that you can't really utilize the powerful and then it falls off. Um, the damage is okay. It's like reasonable, what you would expect for a card of this level, so like, but I, I feel like most of the secondary effects of the card just are, they don't do very much most of the time. Um, I think if this, the best situation to have a Colossal Blow is if you're all in on um, a physical comp, like you have like several physical damage dealers, maybe, and you just see this, you might pick it up as a tech card just in case you manage to run into some insane reinforced comp. Um, but. Yeah, you can generally power through Reinforce if you've got enough, like, Vulnerable and stuff. Oh yeah, if it was cheaper, if it did less damage and was cheaper, and and maybe both upgrades had any monster instead of just the one upgrade, it would be uh, much more takeable. I would take it just in case. I would take it just as a, a, you know, if we run into Reinforce, because the investment is not that high, but otherwise the investment is, like, a little too much. 
All right, next one we're gonna put defend. I think defend just goes in situational. It's a good early game sort of block card. It costs one energy, blocks a decent amount for one energy, but that's you know that's what it is. That's all it does. We're not expecting much else out of our common card. Eventually, you're probably gonna cut your defense because you have more impactful um, block cards to play on your tank. But it does its job early, and that's all we want to do. It's not something that I want to play every single turn. Oftentimes, I'll just skip the card because I'm not getting attacked. Defend is oftentimes like it's nice to have, but sometimes you don't even play it, and sometimes you don't even want to new deck. So it goes into situational for me. All right, next up. We have Demolishing Blow. A Demolishing Blow is a bit of a weird one because Yogger exists and that makes Demolishing Blow like core plus 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 when you're in any run that has Yogger in it. If you're talking specifically, let's put this play this play around this card in a Yogger comp, it's definitely one of these two tiers. If we talk about the card generally where we don't always have Yogger, let's put it in generally strong. Let's go with generally strong because I do. Actually, think that um, like the six cost version, although it is like his your entire turn, it is still like sort of seventy damage on turn one or something, if you can draw on turn one, which is crazy good. Yeah, so I think overall, I think Demolishing Blow, especially the yellow version, is super impactful. The blue version is obviously still good. Um, even these other versions, and again, they have the advantage of being able to hit any monster you want. Um, so you're not stuck trying to bash down the frontliners. So I think overall I would say that Demolition Blow is a good card. Alright, next up, Demoralizing Shout. So I'm gonna put Demoralizing Shout into situational tier, I think. Demoralizing Shout is actually very strong if you can get it in Act 1. Because the Act 1 boss in the Noblest Challenge is not immune to weak. So you can actually weaken the Act 1 boss for a turn. Yeah, the <laughs> the sound effects is, is definitely another S tier. <laughs> it can make um, a lot of challenging and difficult um, hallway fights a lot easier too. I do generally think that this blue upgrade is kind of crappy. You don't want to play weak more than once generally and you lose all the vulnerable. The yellow version is very good. Like getting 3 plus 1 fall vulnerable and demoralizing type potentially is nuts. And even if you don't have the fall, 3 is still really good. Yeah, so I think overall the card is very good, and, and it is better the earlier you get it. I would generally skip a Demoralizing Shout if I were to see it in the second half of Act 2, because at that point, um, you know, it doesn't affect the bosses, and there's a limited amount of fights where I can really get impact, impact out of it. And it is still a fairly expensive card to just play to make it vanish. Like, it's 3 cost on everyone except Bree, and Bree it's 2 cost if you take the right hand side, if you take Transition to get the discount. That's still a lot of energy investment just to vanish a card. But yeah, overall, if you can find this card early, um, and the earlier you find it, the better it will be. Alright, next up, Devastate. Devastate for me also goes in situational. So this is another card that has crazy scaling potential. Um, but it also allows you to, at minimum, deal 50 damage to a target on turn 1 for 6 energy or whatever turn you get it. It, it sort of depends on when you draw it. It, has, it definitely has a lot of awkward downsides and awkward moments where you can't repeat it up to a lot. But if you do have the energy available, it does allow you to slap a dude, a backline guy, for a bunch of damage early on, and then it just keeps getting better with scaling. Um, so I think I don't really complain about, you know, I wouldn't really, I would like to take Devastate a lot of the time. It's just sometimes that when you're going to draw it in an awkward hour, you might not have enough energy to make it worth it. You might draw it before you've applied your scaling, and it sort of becomes awkward then as well. Um, and it's a very energy intensive card. So even with like Tireless, and for example, if you're playing Grookly, you're probably not taking Tireless if you're going Damage Root, you're probably taking Endless Fury. Um, this thing will easily suck up like five, five, six energy every couple of turns, and it can actually be quite hard to actually play all of the, re maximize the repeats um, consistently. So I think for that reason that like you can't always get maximum value out of the card a lot of the time. Um, makes it more situational than I otherwise, it would otherwise potentially would be. I think the card is good and it has insanely good potential. Um, obviously, you're not likely to see it that early, but sometimes you will see it early. Um, you can get it in the draft, whatever. Um, and it's pretty good if you can get it early and you can somehow build a scaling engine around it. But it's not like, it does not win games by itself, put it that way. 
Alrighty, so do it yourself. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think it goes here. I think it's just a, a weird card. It's, it's a cool card in theory, but like, I don't know. It requires you to have another person you want to give taunt to. And like, so the, the situation where this exists is that you have two warriors in your composition and your DPS warrior uses do it yourself on your, on your tank warrior or something. <laughs> so like, and, but then your DPS warrior spends two energy on a card that doesn't do anything for th their damage. So it's, it's just a very strange card. It's definitely good for trolling people. I will see, yeah, if you can get the trolling go in. No, I, I think like the most ideal thing is to obviously apply taunt to like a thorn stacker or maybe you have, uh, I don't even know, like Andrin with a billion evasion or something or like Heine with um, DPS Heine with um, his reactive laser. Those are sort of like the best scenarios I think for it, but it's sort of very niche and most of the time you don't want to take this card because it, it's sort of, you, you're just going to kill someone with it. You're going to kill one of your teammates with it. So, no, I don't know, a bit weird. Bit of a weird card, but it's got some potentially interesting applications. All right, move on. End of Rage, obviously, clearly in a core card. It's, it has nothing but upside. Yeah, so Enrage is not, I don't really like there's much to say about Enrage. It's draw neutral, energy positive card. It gives you an extra energy for your turn. That's insanely power, impactful. All of the upgrades are really good on damage dealers because, you know, it's just extra damage for your entire turn. Um, the only time this is ever bad is if you happen to draw it with a card and then run out of energy before you can play it, but that happens very rarely. Um, yeah, overall, you know, you'll take as many Enrages as you can. Um, if you were offered 20 enrages, you would have a 20 enrage deck, like, without even worrying about it. You just, just, you just, you just keep taking them. What about the flesh mustache? Oh, gosh. The flesh mustache. It is true. After someone pointed that out, I can't unsee it. It looks so weird. It does look weird. <laughs> I can't even tell, explain why it looks weird. It just looks weird. Yeah, even with the flesh mustache, I think it's a call card. Alright, moving on to Entrench. So I think Entrench, I'm going to put it in generally strong. So the thing about Entrench specifically is this yellow, if, if the card, if this was the only version of Entrench you could see, the yellow version, it would be a core card 100% of the time. Because it, it basically gives your team like two turns of not taking damage. I mean, that's not always true, but you know, supplemented with some other block cards. It sort of just makes your team impervious to damage for two turns. It's extremely impactful. Um, unfortunately, like you're often only going to see the unupgraded Entrench um, more often than not. And this is a lot less impactful. And the energy cost is a little much for what it gives you. Yeah, blue is okay. Blue, blue is not so bad. If you have plus one Reinforce, then it gets a lot better too. And if you can draft that... Yeah, sometimes the Reinforce is wasted, and other times the Reinforce can actually be quite good. Um, but yeah, I do think Entrench is just its just a little bit too expensive um, for what it really provides. Um, you know, with 4 energy, especially before you get like level 3 and any discounts out, you're going to be playing Entrench and not a lot of other stuff. So it can be a little bit of a struggle to make it work, and sometimes you're going to not want to play Entrench and prioritize other cards over it. It's Overall, it is a pretty good card. Exploit openings, alright. I don't know wh where it goes. I'm going to put it in niche because it's not like the card is terrible if you can somehow apply a bunch of sight. But it does require you... This is completely teammate reliant. There's no way for a warrior to generate sight. There's not very many characters can generate decent levels of sight. You're basically looking at Nez and you're looking at Sylvie with a bleed sight build. And I don't, and maybe there are some specific items I, that I can't remember that will help a lot with that. But generally, it's just those two. So if you don't have a Nez and you don't have a Sylvie who wants to play what is generally the weaker build of just going that or range damage, then this card is really good. <laughs> but most of the time, it, it does nothing. Generally more useful. Yeah, okay, let's put it in Extreme Niche then. And we also have, like, we still have the, must the the targeting restrictions on these two. On white and, and yellow, which means that, um, yeah, those are also a struggle. It's also a very late game orientated card. 
like even like Nez and Sylvie etc are not applying a boatload of sight until late game. Early game they're doing a little bit usually and not a lot. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, yeah you, I agree with you guys, it's, uh, Extreme Niche makes more sense. I would much rather be playing Carnage than playing this card ever, and like in like 95% of situations, so that, that makes sense. Alright, for Fast Strike, um, it goes in the, in the, the niche tier because it can only ever hit the front and it just doesn't do very much. You know, it's just a bug standard common card that does a little bit of stuff. It's it's the best things about it is again it procs it procs onslaught for cheap it procs um, follow up for and for a cheap energy price and sometimes a little bit of chip damage on the front guy is sort of okay but you know fast strike doesn't do very much so ideally we want to be playing more impactful cards with our energy um, obviously once you hit level three and onwards it's just sort of like a free little bit of damage and that can be okay but yeah it's a basic card and it does basic things. Next up, First Aid. I'm going to put First Aid into the Situational tier. Um, I think First Aid is actually a pretty decent card. It's a skill, so obviously it's very good on Bree, but even without Bree, it's still good. It, it especially shines when you're running a healerless or low healing composition, and sometimes having splashing a First Aid or two on like a tank warrior can just help uh, sort of keep your, your team sustained overall. The reason why I'm playing situations here is if you do have a dedicated healer, oftentimes you just don't need to invest in the energy or the card um, to heal people because your healer is healing and you're, if you're playing a tank warrior, you're blocking. Yeah, so I think overall it's it's a decent card, but it's often overshadowed by actually just having a healer. So Flanking Strike, this is a card that always hits the backline and does decent damage and imply, applies a negligible amount of fury, <laughs> unless you can find a bunch of plus fury. I think Flanking Strike sort of goes in niche as well. It, back, back, back monster attacks are, are a little bit better than front monster attacks. There is a higher percentage chance that the back enemy is the guy you want to kill first over the front enemy. Um, but it doesn't always that doesn't always apply, and I just don't really think that Flanking Strike is just a little bit underwhelming for what it does. Um, only value is fury generation. Yeah, the problem is in Noblest Challenge, you only get plus one fury charge unless you find good items. So a lot of the time, this is giving you two fury only. I mean, late game, it's a little bit better, I guess. Once you hit, if you hit level five in Grotli, it can give you five fury, which is, to be fair, quite impactful. So like, it can be worth hanging onto it, especially though this one cost vanish version, which would become zero cost. Zero cost, gain five fury, deal some damage. Like, it's actually not bad at all. If you can find other sources of Fury Generation, you're probably not worrying too much about, like, getting maximum flanking strike value. Um, so I think I'm okay where, where it is. It is where it is. But, yeah, if you don't have any other better ways to generate Fury, having a couple of flanking strikes is not, like, the worst thing ever. All right, next thing. Furious Slash. Furious Slash is, like, the late-game monster. This is the Grookly poster card, right? <laughs> Correctly posters unite. It goes in here for me. Exact same issue with Carnage. It's actually worse than Carnage because it only hits the front monster. And if if I only worried about late game scaling, this card goes straight into Core again. It's probably a, I don't know if it's a card that people use in high level madness for Correctly or not. But um, the big issue with the card for me is that for fifty percent of the game at least, it does almost nothing. You know, it needs like you need to have about like 30 fury or something to make this deal about 30 damage. This is about you know maybe slightly less, less maybe like 25 fury for it to equal the damage of a th on any other three cost card. In early game, that will literally take like 10 turns. Yeah, that's exactly true, Otaku. It's sort of like mega scales with fury, but that's also very redundant. So it ends up being just overkill. But also, like, it is fun to, like, kill an enemy boss in, like, one smash to the face with, for, like, 10,000 damage. So, it, it, it's like an... It's a generally strong on the on the cool coolness tier and, and pretty niche otherwise. Alright, next up we have Garden of Thorns. So for Garden of Thorns, 
It's sort of weird. This card is very weird because the blue upgrade is very good for a Solon's build. And I find that the other upgrades are, are very unimpactful. Like splitting, generally you don't care so much about having thorns on the entire team versus just having it on one person. It doesn't get like exponentially better by splitting it. You do apply a couple of extra thorns because you're technically applying thorns to each person. It just doesn't ever feel like super good to be doing that IMO. So it's quite hard to judge this card because this is completely different. This is basically its own card by itself. And I do think this is like pretty good for a thorns build overall. But I think because... We generally, you don't guarantee to see that upgrade. I guess it goes in niche. <laughs> it's just a very strangely made card. If you have like plus 10, like plus 5 bonds or something, then it gets a lot better because obviously you're adding a bunch of extra ones on top. And obviously Grand Power, I guess, as well. So it's not like splitting is like useless, but it's not that great. And especially when you're thinking about interactions with Yaga, splitting is actively worse than holding it on a single character. Generally, for Thorns, in my experience, the best way to scale Thorns in, in all those challenges is just get really lucky with items. A lot of items just generate Thorns for you every single turn, and those are like some of the best ways to actually get a good Thorns build going. Alright, Grinding Wheel. Grinding Wheel goes into cards, well, obviously it's only for DPS Warriors, but that's not even necessarily true. If you can't get a... a yellow grinding wheel on your tank and you just use it on one of your other warriors or scouts um very very good grinding wheel is basically like the premier way to scale um damage if you can find one early investing three energy or even four energy getting your sharp up to you know 12 16 you're, you're gonna cruise through fights after that even if your cards are not that great it sort of alleviates the need to have good cards when you can add so much sharp for free um, yeah, it's good at all stages of the game. You're happy to invest the energy. I'm happy to to grab it and take it. Um, if you can get lucky and find plus sharp cards, it gets even more nutty. Um, yeah, it's just a very, very, very solid card. If you see one of these in the draft, you're going to take it. Even if it's with two crap cards in the random pack, I'm going to take it because it's that good. All right, next up, Ground Slam. So Ground Slam... I think I put it here, unfortunately. I always wanted Grand Slam to be good. It just doesn't do enough, to be honest. So it's like a rare card. It, like The vulnerable is nice, but it's only one. So I, I, realistically, it's only two, unless you can find a bunch of plus vulnerable, which is not always happening. Um, and you end up just like splitting damage. You end up just like splitting a bunch of damage across four people, and then like you spend a ton of energy to make that happen. And while the better in Obelisk Challenge remains to be singling out and focusing down individual targets, this card is always going to remain sort of niche. There's also not like incredible follow up to AoE, like a Grand Slam. Like, there's not a lot of other good AoE options in Crack. Like, you have like Wrecking Ball, but Wrecking Ball sort of is bad by itself because it's an, an, uh, an overcharge card, so... Next... We have Guard. I'm not sure exactly where I put this. It's in either Generally Strong or Courtier. It's one of these two. It sort of depends on the character. I think I'm going to put it in Generally Strong because if you do have... Like, an upgraded Entrench, if you are playing Heiner and you already have Steel Forged, uh, or you can find other access access to um, Fortify, then Guard is less needed. There's also cases where you just don't need Fortify. You don't actually care if your block falls off every turn because your healer is good or like you're playing Bree and you can just use defensive strategy to stack it a bunch more. I find that like Fortify is something that's <clears throat> is very nice to have, but it's not like absolutely mandatory in every run to, ha to have Fortify um, to win runs. So like, I think guard is a good card, and I think I wouldn't ever be upset to find a guard and pick up a guard so that I can um, give one of my teammates Fortify or one of the weaker, squishier heroes Fortify or even the, the frontliner if you know you're going to get hit by a big attack. But it's 100% not mandatory, so yeah, I'll put it in generally strong. Um, but I don't think it's a core card. It's not. I if I don't sometimes I will skip over a guard. Sometimes I won't even play guards when I get them in my hand because I'd rather play other cards. Alright, next up we have Hamstring. It goes down here, unfortunately. It's just... It, it's like... 
just it's like charge. It's just charge again. I mean, it does have a version that hits any monster, but one slow and then two slow is just so unimpactful. You know, there are pacing hell applies two one slash and they grade it to two too slow to everybody, and that just like is so huge. And then you have things like Shock Nova from Mages that apply 3, and then you could boost, boost it up to 4. Or I can play Hamstring and, and apply 1 slow to a guy, you know, or, um, you know, Front Monster would be able to 2 or 3. It's just, it just doesn't do enough for the card, and it's, you know, there's a lot of cards I'd rather be playing. Maybe if the slow was 1 higher on each of the versions, it would be a bit better. Okay, next up we have Headbutt. I think for headbutt, it just goes in niche. I think it's it's a card that does a little bit, but not a lot. <laughs> it's sort of a bit weird, but like again, we have front monster restrictions. It just it doesn't deal that much damage. It's like 15 base if you play it first. Yeah, if there were like actual ways to synergize discards in an interesting way, then headbutt becomes a completely different card but right now it's 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 either a downside or it's just a neutral thing where you just, just discard a card you either don't want to play or couldn't play because of energy cost restrictions or whatever um but yeah it, it's it's sort of an okay card that does some okay stuff sometimes but it's it doesn't really do very much again next up heavy strike heavy strike get in the bin <laughs> this card's trash I wanted to tell you, man. It's like, it's a three cost card that draws a card. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna spend three energy and draw one card, and then what am I gonna do? I've got no energy left. It's three energy to draw a card. Like, it's just, it's just so bad. I don't know. I don't know. This, it, it's just, it doesn't make sense from a from a design perspective for me. Like, it costs too much, and like, yeah, it doesn't do a lot of damage. I mean, okay, it actually does a reasonable amount of damage, but it's front master restricted, and yeah, the main benefit is it's supposed to draw your card, but like with a three energy cost, it just really limits what cards you can even play after drawing. So it goes, it goes in the bin. It goes in extremely niche. Just get destiny, right? Exactly. If I have cloud song, then this card is awesome. S tier card with Cloud Song, maybe. Maybe it's not even good with that Cloud Song. Alright, moving on. Helping Hands. I think I'm gonna put Helping Hands into Situational. And I know adventure players are screaming at me right now, like, whoa, Helping Hands is like the best card in the game. Get the fuck out. So the reason why I think Helping Hand is just a situational card is that it's all you kind of do is trade one of your draws and give it to one of your your allies. And, and generally, in Obelisk Challenge, you're not having the solo carry, the guy who's doing all the actual work, playing all the damage. Every character needs to contribute. So it's not like Helping Hand is a bad card. But oftentimes, like, you know, if I'm drafting, I'm not like, oh my gosh, this pack has a Helping Hand. I'm going to take it over some other pack. I'm just like, oh, this has a Helping Hand and some other good cards. I guess I'll take it. And it's cool that I've got a Helping Hand. You know, it's sort of... It, it, it's nice to have, but you never really, you know, it's not a card that we need to uh, be successful in the runs. And oftentimes, you just want to play cards that do more things and give a draw to an ally. Next up, we have Impale. I think I put it in niche. I think the main the main benefit for Impale here is to apply debuffs to the front two enemies, which is sort of what it does. You don't expect the damage to be great. The vulnerable one is like can be good. It can if you already have some running ball, adding some extra running ball is obviously quite good. And then like five bleeds to two targets is fine. But it's not like crazy. And you can never hit anyone but the front two monsters with it, so it, it it's a card that like I don't hate seeing. Um if for example on Grickly I, I have a normal blood for blood. Yeah, it hits a Trunky, <laughs> so you're, and then you're very sad. If I have a normal Blood for Blood, and then Pale, and then like a Blood Feeding, it can be a reasonable way to restore some health with Blood Feeding, but like, apart from that, it's, it's, it just doesn't, you know, it just sort of isn't that impactful. I think if it had a little more, like one more Bleed Charge on each, maybe two more, it made me feel a little bit better. Next up, 
we have Infury. This is where it gets weird again because like Infury is is absolutely a core card on Grickly for Fury stacking, and obviously for everyone else, it's probably completely useless. <laughs> <laughs> Which means that like it, I gotta put it as a core card, but like with the big caveat that this is specifically for Grickly and Grickly only. Like no other character is gonna be generating enough Fury to for Infury, but Infury is a game winner. It is. You, you know, you probably don't want five of them, but if you can get one or two of them, you can, you know, you basically guarantee that you're going to be ending fights in, like, three or four turns, because you're going to get to, like, 200 Fury and just, like, kill everything. Yeah, there's not really that much more to say, right? It's a very good late game. It's pretty weak early game. Obviously, I don't want to see it early. I might just take one early if I see it, if I know that I'm strong, and just play it as a, as a dead card. If only there was a card with cards that were sometimes good based on what was going on in the game. Yeah, that's true. I guess maybe for my own logic, it shouldn't be in call because it's a really bad early game. <laughs> Kappa. All right, I'm bad at this. All right, it's it's very difficult. It's difficult to do this. <laughs> try to try to do my best. Yeah, okay. I, I, let's put it in generally strong. I, I take it back because it is a bad early game card, and I don't want to like. It is definitely something that we care about in the later half of the game. Um. But unlike other scaling cards that I put into niche, um, it is like a guaranteed way to scale because you're always going to be applying um, Fury. All right, next up, Intercept. This goes here. It's a card that just, again, it's one of our lovely common cards that does very little. It just doesn't do a lot. Honestly, the one the one class intercept when you're level three and have a discount is really not that bad. It's 14 block on anyone you want, and it will cost zero. But having a base intercept that's just like five, you know, maybe seven or nine block with the plus two block charges, you know, it it, it will help out. But like, it's not something you know. I'm cutting intercepts late game pretty much every single time I play. You know, intercepts are a primary cut target for later in the game. And they're just a card that does very little for, for you know, what it is. And it's a, sort of unimpactful. Alright, next up. Intimidate. Intimidate goes into generally strong for me. It's not that Intimidate isn't an insanely good card. Because it is an insanely good card. But unfortunately, we see this version a lot. And we can only add one vulnerable to this. So it's one mark and two vulnerable only. Sometimes you can play that on an enemy. And then they take their turn and it just falls off. The only reason like this isn't a call card for me is just uh, if I'm looking at the draft, I don't prioritize Intimidate over like high damage cards. I'm not prioritizing Intimidate over Battle Shout, for example. I will take, you know, Intimidate's like, oh, this pack's got Intimidate and some other good stuff. I'll, this is a good pack. But it's not, this pack is good just because it has Intimidate and the other two cards are trash. Because it's it just, it is very much a very solid support card, more than it is like a you know, one of your carry centerpieces. I think overall it's a good card, but you can live without it. Alrighty, next up, Invigorating Blow. This unfortunately goes in niche tier. It's just very expensive to, and it, it, technically it costs one less energy than it should because it gives you an, an energize back and it gives you some vitality, but these are not like things that are really helping me this turn. They're sort of like next turn, and again, to to actually be able to use this on any enemy, I have to spend an extra energy. You know, the, the, the upgrade that allows me to hit any monster costs three instead of two. Cheaper and weaker, like Charge Bright. Yeah, it could it could work a bit better if it was like that. Like this card is just something that um, I will mainly play on Bree because she gets one in her Stein deck. And it's the card that you play when you don't really have anything else to do on your turn. So you just spend two energy to gain a little bit of vitality and get an energy next turn, and that's sort of it. And you do a little bit of chip damage. So yeah, I think, unfortunately, it's just not that great of a card. All right, next up, Last Stand. I think Last Stand goes into the generally strong category for me. The yellow version is obviously insanely strong because it gives you guaranteed zero cost cards. Fatigue, the, the Silver One Fatigue is always fun. I thought that was a bit strange because every tank is... A, apart from maybe Heine, but even I think Heine should be taking Tireless, so the Fatigue doesn't even affect you at, at that point. Um, it's a cool flavor thing, though, with the Last Stand, I guess. Um, 
Yeah, the only time this card is actively bad is if when you draw it too late in your in your draw cycle. Yeah, or you have a bunch of crappy cards that it can hit. So those are the two ways it kind of sucks. For the most part, it does allow you to um, thin your deck out a little bit quicker, play some, hopefully play some expensive, or at least good, defensive cards quicker, and that kind of jazz. So yeah, it's and it's a skill which Bree likes. And uh, Bree, Bree actually likes this quite a lot because we can, we don't get discounts on defensive on uh, yeah on defend cards but we can get a discount on the skill and then also get discounts on defense cards. So, yeah, I think it's pretty good overall. Um, you, you're not unhappy to see it, for sure. And obviously then you get the niche interaction with Citadel or other crazy expensive cards like Shield Wall with this version that just allows you to play them um, for zero, which is kind of crazy. Next up, Leaf Slam. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a niche card. I think it's like slightly better than than Heavy Strike, sort of, in a roundabout way. It's not that much better, to be honest. It probably could go an extremely niche too. The only thing in Redeeming Factor is I think Back Monster is just a little bit more applicable than Front Monster. And this one applies 5 Crack, which is not like the worst Crack card I've ever seen. <laughs> it's a lot higher than a lot of other cards. Yeah, I think overall Leaf Slam is like, kinda bad. And you're not going to get a lot of value out of it sometimes, but occasionally you'll see the yellow upgrade and it doesn't feel terrible to play. It's a decent amount of damage for 3 energy. I don't know. To be honest, you're not really going to take this card a lot of the time, so maybe it should be extremely niche. I'm just going to move extremely niche. It's, it's sort of... I don't. I can't really imagine the good, the good situations I want to play this, to be honest. This is the only version I would want to play, and even then, it's only okay. Alright, next up, Mame. So Mame is a card that I think niche fits a little better. Just because like the three slow, the three all four slow that it applies is impactful, even if it, it suffers all the problems that Leap Slam and, and Heavy Strike generally do. You know, if I'm using Mame on a frontline enemy and I'm spending three energy on it, it probably doesn't feel great. But if I'm at least slowing them, like maybe that does something for me sometimes. And this this version of the card I honestly think is good. I actually generally think this is a, an, an okay card. Like. Dealing a decent amount of damage and then applying three slow oftentimes means that you, you know, you're the rest of your team can go ahead of that target either this turn or next turn, um, which means that you can probably pile on enough damage to get the kill on that enemy before they get to take another turn. Yeah, I think the blue version of the card is actually decent. These ones are much more niche. Yellow and white versions are much, much more niche. Never find yourself using it. Yeah, I mean, you're not often likely to even draft this. I, it's in the destroyer pack, and the destroyer pack is full of these. Extremely expensive, unimpactful blunt cards like Leap Slam and Heavy Sl and Heavy Strike, but very occasionally you might see a Mame, and it might you know a blue Mame and a couple of other cards in that pack that are sort of okay, and just just pick it and get some decent value out of it. Next up, and this is one where everyone again they're gonna you're gonna scream at me. This is Mortal Strike. It's a call card for me. Th there's a very specific reason for this, and that's. It shows up twice in the draft as a capstone, which means you're guaranteed to get one of these two versions most of the time you see the card. You're gonna get, and both of these allow you to hit, to hit any um, enemy. Yeah, in the context of OC, it's extremely powerful. It's one of the best tools that you can get to just delete enemy backliners. You know, it's gonna do like probably like seventy to eighty percent of an enemy's health. Well, probably somewhere between like sixty and eighty percent um, of an enemy backliner's health. So getting it on turn one is very good. And then you apply this version applies some vulnerable, which means that anyone else who's attacking them gets to finish them off a lot easier. The decay is like very situationally useful against certain enemy types like Dryad, who are oftentimes gonna heal. Yeah, that also can is niche and helps. And I think for like the first half of the game, for Act 1 and half of Act 2, this card does a lot. It does a lot. And it's just yeah, it's just one of the most safest guaranteed ways to get through Act 1 successfully with a Damage Warrior is to get a Mortal Strike. As well as that, it is a very good uh, target for Magnus' follow-up ability if you're running Damage Magnus because you've got multi-warrior comp. Um, you know, getting a 5 cost Mortal Strike for 0 energy is feels really good. Um, and you can oftentimes play a bunch of other stuff out in that same turn then and then it gets very, very strong. Okay, I'm going to move on to Overpower now. And honestly, sort of similar to Mortal Strike. It's not as good as Mortal Strike. It's OP. It is. 
Uh, I just wanted these two. I think the big issue is that the yellow version of the card is basically as good as Mortal Strike, but then the other version, blue and white and base, are just not anywhere near as good. Feels okay, man. I think I'm going to put it in situational. So Overpower is a Destroyer pack capstone, but Destroyer pack is one of the worst or theme. Destroyer theme is one of the worst themes that you can actually pick in Obelisk Challenge drafting generally. Yeah, so Yellow Power is quite good. You can dump 6 energy into it and it'll deal like 70 damage and apply 4 vulnerable, um, which if it doesn't outright kill an enemy will get them in a very good spot to be killed. These two versions of the card is unfortunately a lot worse. It just applies some crack. It's mainly just used for the big damage bunk. But yeah, o o OC cards are generally sort of not very well statted and they scale extremely poorly. So like generally OC cards that do a lot, a lot base wise, or they're fine. So yeah, I think Overpower is honestly one of the better blunt cards. It's just you're not gonna see it too often. Alright, next up Piercing Howl. This goes in generally strong, and the only reason is is because you can't guarantee yellow. If you could guarantee yellow, it's as core as core gets. But these versions of the card, I mean, I think blue is still fine, but like white just feels a little bad to play sometimes. It's like it's not that too slow AoE slow isn't impactful, because it is, but too slow too vulnerable is absolutely nuts. Yeah, I think just too slow, it's still a very strong maybe it is just car anyway. Maybe too it, it sort of depends on the comp. If you're if your comp is if you're like one warrior, two mages and a healer, too slow is oftentimes not enough to be to make your entire team go first. Maybe they'll go first in some of the slower enemies, but sometimes they won't. If I see blue, if I see yellow Howl, I'm likely to take that pack regardless of the other cards in it. But if I see one of these two Howls, I will skip those packs if they have crappy cards with them, which oftentimes is the case. Yeah, so that's why I'm gonna justify putting it into generally strong. It's just generally the upgrade quality on non-yellow vision is not quite as strong. All right, next up, Pommel. This is... In each card, it's a low impact front monster only common <laughs> that applies a little bit of crack, but that's sort of it. It doesn't do very much. It has a low cost. Sometimes you'll play it for because you don't have anything better to do. That's sort of it. There's not really much to say. I'm never really taking this card from card rewards because yeah, it's very minimal impact. It's just sort of meh, but like you you have the starting one on Bree, so maybe you'll use it sometimes and. Because you don't have much else to do, but saw it. Okay, precise strike. <clears throat> Welcome to the generally strong category that is precise strike, <laughs> because it is a card that where the white version, the white version targets any monster, and that is sad. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, get the get the get the pitchforks out, get the torches out, get get this guy. He's an idiot. No, generally in my experience, Precise Strike is just quite good. It's quite good at killing backliners, and it allows me to do that. Whereas a lot of other cards, it, it, you know, they can struggle. One out, yeah, okay, yes. Yeah, so the occasion time you see this one, you get very sad. I hate seeing Precise Strike and, and then hovering over it and seeing um, the yellow upgrade. And I'm just like, oh, for goodness sake, it should not be better than AoE Strike. Well, the difference is, is that Precise Strike deals 14, 15 damage to one target, and Cleave deals 6 damage to every target. And it doesn't actually help you kill one enemy very well. Precise Strike over Devastate. Alright, now, now you're making me look at the base stat on Devastate. If, it deals 50% more damage for the energy cost if you don't repeat it. <laughs> if. <laughs> Maybe Devastate is under, underrated. Maybe Devastate should be in generally strong. Maybe you're right. Maybe it should be. I'll think about it. Imprecise strike. Yeah, I think I've made that joke before about the yellow version being imprecise strike. It's definitely an accurate um, name. All right, next up, provoke. So provoke is available as a defender capstone. Honestly, taunting a monster could be cool. That could actually be a really good way to make front monster only cards more interesting. Is if you have a way to apply taunt to enemies. I don't know if applying taunt to enemies would be broken. Probably not. Otherwise, you just target them with attacks anyway. I think I think I put provoke in niche. I, I, it just I don't know. Taunt is a weird thing where 
a lot of the times taunt isn't good because you want to spread the damage out over your team. But sometimes it is very good if you have thorns or steel forge or you actually have a ton of self block but not a good AOE block. So it's sort of weird. It's but like this card is worse than a defend if you don't care about the taunt. And then there are situations where you taunt and you just kill yourself because like <laughs> the enemies just stack a bunch of damage and you just die. Which to be honest, I feel like that has been happening a lot less lately. When especially with like Heiner taunt, I've been taunting at like 30 block and then being fine. But it might just be because I'm killing enemies a lot quicker than I used to be um, in runs in general. So. But yeah, I think overall, I think just a taunt is sort of this weird niche thing. Um, which makes Provoke this weird niche thing. Uh, Pulverize, it's, it's another niche card. It's a card that like requires a lot of crack to be good. It technically has like 4x crack scaling. But, well, so I guess it's 3x crack scaling. Because it has x based on crack and then two separate damage instances. Which are blunt, which are also affected by crack. But early game, it's very hard to apply more than like six crack. <laughs> it's like it's so difficult to apply a meaningful amount of crack to make this card good. Like the, it's just it just struggles a lot. But like in theory, I guess if you can put a crack build together, maybe you can find destroy gauntlets or something. Or you have an, an ice mage with Shasta. Like game, it can be perfectly like reasonable card to play. Yeah, the the it is also very much overshadowed by pummel, pummel and and. Bludgeon are both sort of very, you know, I, I think those are what I would consider the premium blunt crack cards. So this one just sort of gets overshadowed. Shadowed. And it's also much worse. For example, you compare this to Pummel and like um, Breeze level 1 damage card, which I've forgotten again. Unforgiving Nature. Um, obviously Pummel procs it like five times and this procs it once. So it's it's kind of sad for that reason as well. But speaking of Pummel, it's next in the list. Yeah, Pummel is... It goes in the same place, but I do think it's in a better spot than Pulverize is. It just has the same general requirement where you do need to stack Crack. It is better because it does work with other sources of scaling. So if you can get Bless, if you can get Mark. So it's not only reliant on Crack. Yeah, it procs on hits, which can be quite useful. Uh, Grickly, for example, could at least apply a bunch of bleed with this with his uh, initial weapon. Like in terms of getting really good value out of the card, um, I think it needs. It is still niche, but it is more definitely more applicable than pulverize. Maybe pulverize is extremely niche. I'm not sure. It kind of scales off of one thing that um, you ca it's very inaccessible. Is a card built for scaling? Yes, it is. It is definitely a card built for scaling, which maybe like in the, the context of this. Tier mate. Maybe I should have just had like a sca scaling card like lit like tier, which is doesn't really make sense in the context of the things, but maybe it would at least help identify these cards. Things like this and Carnage and Furious Slash to a certain degree. That's what I thought situational means. Yeah, maybe it should be in situ maybe I should move them all into situational. You know what? Let's do it. I I understand the reasoning. It's it's I think Furious Slash stays in niche because it's it's still sort of a worse scaling card than these two. Yeah, okay, let's put them in situational. But they are sort of poor early game. Which is maybe why that maybe this is a justification why I wanted to put them lower is just that like early game there is so much focus on getting good early game cards. But so you don't want to take them early, but that doesn't mean that they're bad. Alright, next up we have punch. Is punch situational just because it's punch and punch is cool? <laughs> No, it's another unimpactful damage common card. Sometimes you'll find an upgrade that makes it hit any target, which it, honestly is not that bad. Like having this punch, like the yellow version of punch, is quite good a lot of the time. Like obviously it's not like a game changing card, but it can sometimes just give you that extra little bit of damage to kill an enemy a turn earlier or something. The front monster punch doesn't do very much. But yeah, I mean, it, it's free. It, it, I mean, it's free in the sense it doesn't cost energy, it costs a draw. So eventually you're going to want to replace your punches with cards that do more impactful things. Especially once you get access to discounts. Alright, next for, next up is Push Forward. And this is obviously a core card. This card is insane. This, this is one of the best cards in the Warrior deck like for any tank. It's both a de defend and a skill. 
so like it gets discounts for all of the tanks. It's especially good on Bree because it procs defensive strategy and command and conquer and like, you know, and just makes your entire team go fast. And the other thing that makes it insane is it's a capstone in the commander pack. So 50% of the time you're going to get this card in your runs. So like, holy moly, does it, it become crazy. Like it basically guarantees that most of your team is going to be going before the rest of the enemy team. And who am I? This is this is a card that I will happily take two of every single game. If I see two, I will take two. Especially on Bree, because it's a card that applies block and is also a skill, so she can play for really cheap. And we're running out of space here. This is a problem. We're, we're getting towards the end of the list, sort of, but <laughs> I'm going to have to start scrolling because I'm running out of... I can't even see the bottom row fully anymore. Yeah, next up uh, is Rampage. This is... I think I put it in niche. It's not so bad early. Maybe it goes into situational. The, the biggest downside is just the randomness, but like it, it has very good base damage. It is a very good card for just dealing some damage. I don't know. One of these two. <laughs> I, I'll put it in situation. Yeah, well, I, I think early game rampage is quite good because it just it just does a lot of damage. If it can hit the right target. If you can't hit the right target, obviously it becomes very bad. But like, even if it only hits an enemy once, like 13, like it, it still deals a decent amount of damage. It's sort of, I think, halfway between these. Rampage is fine for Sprite. I think Rampage is an okay card. The, the random nature of it may, means that it can be very impactful or sort of useless, but at least it has, the, the, the upsides are decent. So I think Situational is a good, a good spot for it. Okay, Reckless Charge, I think, I put this here. I don't know, I don't really know how to vibe. It's, this card does so many different things. It deals okay damage, I guess. But like, it's also stuck with the front monster. And it's like an okay way to generate some fury early, but it also costs three energy. I don't know, I think it's sort of too expensive and it, it does so many different things bad, like mediocrely, instead of like focus, being focused on one single thing. I know the Grookly mains are coming out. The Grookly posters are like, yo, did you know I played Reckless Charge in my and then I played Furious Slash for 20 billion damage. You're you're wrong. You suck. <laughs> <laughs> something something it gives me fury. No, the fact that you can only ever hit the front front guy with it, I think, just brings it down. Like if this could hit any monster, it'd be crazy good, man. It'd be crazy good. I think it's, it's, it sort of doesn't do much for its cost, so that's why I would say it's uh, niche. Reckless, ran if it was random monster, I think that would also make the card better. I'd be more inclined to take it if it was random monster. Alright, next we've got uh, Reinforced Steel. I'm gonna put it in Situational. I, I, it's sort of weird, because I generally don't think that like mega stacking block on your tank is good or anything, but I think if you just treat this card like it's a way to generate like 30 block for 3 energy or something because you have 30 block. Yeah, I'm it's sort of a bit weird. Maybe it's okay, I'm going to I'm going to put it down to niche. Like I tried to see this as, as not as a, a I'm not worried about the doubling. I'm just trying to be realistic about the value it's going to give me and that's sort of maybe like 30 40 block for 3, which is fine. But sometimes it gives you nothing, and it is very expensive to play, especially early game. We don't have discounts yet, so eh. I I've used it and it's felt okay. I wouldn't put like five into my deck. Like, I yeah, I guess in theory, if you find a bunch of them, you can run some stupid block block damage build situation, but eh, that's not likely to happen. All right, let's move on to rend. I think rend I just put in this tier. Yeah, rend. I really dislike rend as a card i don't know i just ran a, a a game where i had a bunch of friends actually because they were in packs that had decent stuff maybe i'm being a little unfair to rend by putting it in extremely niche maybe we'll just put it in niche so i think unupgraded rend is like horrifically bad i do think both of the upgrades are actually okay like i said one cost rend is like a better fast strike two cost rend is like it's not good but it does at least early game it's sort of like let's say it's basically 16 so it's six base damage and then it's n let's say 19 unmitigatable damage in a lot of situations like obviously sometimes it gets dispelled or something but a lot of the time the bleed if it's two turns that it goes off 
it's like 19 damage, which is pretty good. It scales terribly. I think the base version is just extremely bad. Like that's that's my biggest problem with it. The, the upgrades are both good, but this you're gonna see this version a lot of the time, and you see this version on Magnus. He has one innately in his deck, and it just feels bad to play. Like for example, I don't think Fast Strike is obviously not very impactful, but like because it costs one less energy and the blue one does too, that makes it much better to proc um, things like onslaught, things like follow up and whatnot. But use, having to use two energy to proc those things always feels quite bad, honestly. Like, you lose a lot of value out of Onslaught and follow-up with the two energy. Well, follow-up less so, to be fair. But I'd rather be playing any other card. Okay, let's move on to Repair Armor. So I think Repair Armor I'm going to put in a generally good tier. I do think Repair Armor is just like this, you know, you just get one. And you, you see one, you're pretty happy to take one. Dispelling Mark is niche, but when, it, when enemies do apply Mark, it's quite good. I think the best thing is just like... A bunch of reinforce and a decent amount of block on a on any hero is just very good. Like there's a lot of enemies early game who are gonna who do some pretty devastating physical attacks. And they're also quite predictable on where they're gonna hit. So enemies like um what's she called? The the happy lady, not the lightning one. God, why am I so bad with names today? It's okay, whatever. Um she'll oftentimes hit the backline or then she'll hit the lowest health hero. Um, so if you know the enemies and you can play around, uh, Repair Armor becomes very impactful with the reinforce to mitigate a lot of damage. Just generally think this card is quite good. It's sort of like an intercept that does a lot more. It does a lot more than the base intercept. Um, and then there's like very situational things as well where this is really good against twins because twins apply a crazy amount of crack to your frontline hero. She's called Sky Hunter. I remembered her name. <laughs> yeah, she's called Sky Hunter. Yeah, you see her in Act 1 a lot. Um, and some of her physical damage enemies, like the um, the wolf guy. Who, the wolf stealthy dude. <laughs> wolf stealthy dude, that guy. So yeah, I think uh, not many people are going to disagree here, but I think Repair Armor is, is pretty solid. And it's, it's, it's good for pretty much the entire game. Alright, next on Repetition Training. I generally think repetition training is decent, but not insane. I'm gonna put it in situational, I guess. The reason why it's decent and not insane is that, like, so a lot of the matter is about playing high cost cards um, once or twice, and then you sort of run out of energy. So it's not great with something like Mall Strike, for example, because you can't really play it twice. Yeah, you don't really rely on a single attack, and you don't really want to play that one repeatedly. This one's a bit weird because it assumes that you can just have the energy to spend on it. Um, and then also, like, the, the, the cost reduction by one is something that sounds really good. But oftentimes I find that fights just end before you really get a lot of value out of the cost reduction. So I think the main benefit of the card is to play a good card twice in one um, deck cycle. Um, and that makes it decent, but oftentimes not like overwhelmingly impactful. You can make, yeah, I guess the other thing is, well, I didn't really talk about the bluff in that I never really tried to make the bluff infinite happen, but you can potentially make an infinite with bluff and with this, make, make the one cost bluff cost zero and make it draw cards and then have two bluffs draw each other, but I don't like playing that way. So yeah, I I try not to consider that in the, in the rating, but yeah, I think overall it's it's okay. All right, next up, safeguard. I think safeguard is um, I'm gonna put it in niche tier. I think this is one of the worst. It's one of the the kind of weirdly expensive but also kind of bad defense cards that exists. There's like a couple of things here. One, you can play the yellow version. Oh, sorry, the blue version here that is guaranteed to get the maximum amount of block you can get because you're going to get it on turn one but also like there's two things here one you're you're not going to have a like a 50 card deck most of the time because you lower card decks are generally much better Two, you spend four energy and all you do is protect yourself so like all your teammates are still vulnerable and you don't really have any energy left to help out your friend like block for the team which means that that's not even great and then the other versions allow you to hit any hero, but then you actually have to draw the card uh, on turn one anyway. It's it's very difficult. I think 
maybe in like adventure or something where you have a lot more control with with scrying and tracing guaranteeing a, a safeguard turn one could be cool could be impactful but like i already have big issues with these x dropout cards just like randomly drawing these at the end of my deck cycle every time and then safeguard is suddenly a four cost block for eight or block for zero even like it gets very bad when it when you look at it from that point of view so if you look at the average like you draw it halfway through your deck i mean the average is draw on turn two which means it only blocks for 20 and a 20 four cost block 20 is kind of poor I do think though two inspire and four fortify is definitely something that you should is not ignorable. Like two inspire is kind of nuts actually. Next up we have second wind. Second wind for me goes into generally strong. This is a insta pick if you have no healer on your team. I generally say like it's just a very safe card to take when you have no healer. But oftentimes I find that if you have a a strong strong healer that's got a good deck and performing well, second wind just sits in your hand and you don't ever play it. Because you just don't have a, a reason to. Like you're healthy, you know, and and the, it can just kind of, you know, maybe they're dispelling frequently, and you just kind of don't have a reason to play this card. I'm um, pretty obviously it gets a little bit better again because it's a skill. But yeah, overall, I'd say Second Wind is solid. It's ex ex especially impactful in healerless runs, um, and and with a healer, it 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 can it can range from very good still if you don't find a lot of dispel, um, to basically useless. I think the where this card shines the least is when you have like a Maluka, a pure healing Maluka on your team, and she is level five, and she's dispelling like two or three debuffs from the entire team every single turn by just playing healing cards, and then your second win oftentimes just does like basically nothing. All right, next up, Sever Archery. I think Sever Archery for me goes in situational. So the reason why. Is like it does. It is a very good, another very strong early game card where it just deals a buttload of damage. You know, you're looking at over two turns, it deals something like 70 damage for two energy, which is very good. I oh, sorry for four energy, which is very good. Um, the reason why it's sort of awkward and maybe not as good as Mortal Strike is that most of the time you're still going to be seeing Front Monster. This is a Marauder Capstone card, so you're usually when you see this in a draft, you're going to be seeing one of these two versions. You're going to see. So 50% of the time you can target anybody with it and it's very good in that situation. It's very close to being equivalent to Mortal Strike. And then the other time you're hitting Front Monster, which honestly with this card, hitting Front Monster is not the worst, but they're oftentimes not the enemy you want to be killing first, so it can be a bit awkward. Next up, Shake It Off also goes in generally strong for me. There is sometimes, you know, again, in a healerless run, this is absolutely a core card because you need to be able to dispel debuffs, especially on your tank. You're going to be getting hit with a lot of debuffs. There are situations where your healer just, you get the right cards on your healer, you pick up mass dispel, or you have a bunch of dispels, or the enemies just generally don't apply a bunch of impactful debuffs sometimes because you're killing them quickly or whatever, um, where sometimes Shake It Off is just a card that you either don't really want to take or a card that you end up just not playing. But yeah, you can't understate the sort of value of Dispel in certain situations is absolutely crucial. And also, depending on like the enemies and the bosses you're facing, um, it can also, you know, become more or less valuable. But yeah, I will say that Shake It Off is not a card that I take every single time I see it, um, but I will take it in a good number um, of sort of uh, situations. So I think it's generally strong. Okay, next up, Sharing is Caring. I think this card is just, it's a niche card. It might even be extremely niche. You know, I changed my mind. This is extremely niche. I don't know, I don't really, like, I guess the purpose of this card is to, is to maybe use something like Reinforce Steel, get yourself to some crazy block amount, and then start splitting it with your team. I can also just play AoE cards that just give block without all the weird requirements. I don't really understand the purpose of it. If you want to do shield as damage, then you don't want to play this card anyway. It's just, I just don't really, like, I, I kind of understand the concept, but I feel like in practice it just never plays out that this is a card that you really want to be playing. Like, you're sort of somehow generating a bunch of bluff for yourself, and then splitting it with one of a hero only is not great. All heroes is a little bit better, but, eh. 
I don't know. It's it's not great. It's it doesn't do very much. All right, next up, we have um, Sharpen. So Sharpen, I'm gonna put into situational tier. And it's not that Sharpen itself is a bad card. My issue with it is that, like, one Sharpen is not enough massive Sharp to be crazy good. Like, when you're generating three Sharp or four Sharp every three turns, you're, you're not really doing that much by yourself. Right, if you can, and this is generally why scouts and stuff are a little bit better, you know, with sharp is that they're much better actually just generating sharp. And you want to hit that critical mass of sharp generation where you're adding like ten, you know, either a burst of sharp where you add like twenty sharp in one turn, which is where, for example, grinding wheel is quite good, or why I consider grinding wheel a lot better than sharpen. Um, or you want to be able to consistently add like ten, you know, five to ten sharp every single turn that your sharp is just going up and up and up. But with this, a sharpen by itself, um, or even like two sharpens, you're you're just you're never gonna get to some crazy high sharp number with just two sharpens. So I I don't think that the card is bad, and I think if you do find other sources of sharp, sharpen gets better. Um, but I think if you don't find other sources of sharp, sharpen um, gives you a little bit of extra damage, but it's not like crazy or anything. Um, so that's why I consider it to be a sort of situational card. Next up, we have Shield Bash. I think I put it in niche. Like for two energy, it's sort of like playing a defend and playing a like a little bit better fast strike in one card. But I also don't really want to play a defend and a fast strike in one card anyway. You know, ideally those are the cards I'm not playing. I'm playing more impactful cards. New players call shield bash. <laughs> I guess it looks cool, right? It's like, oh, this is the card that deals a bunch of damage and you get block and it deals so much for two energy and it's like yeah but also it doesn't though really like oh no i don't have a bit of damage to the frontliner cool yeah i think it's like it's not the worst card if if it's if it's in a pack i'm not like unhappy to see it and i'll play it sometimes but it's definitely a candidate for early cuts for me you know, generally I'm going to be keeping other cards in the deck over this one and preferring to play other cards. So it has a little bit of value and it's still an okay block card sometimes, but it doesn't do very much. So gets gets to be in the niche, the niche thing. All right, next up, Shield Breaker. So I'm going to put Shield Breaker into Situational here. I do generally think that this card is like good, even if you don't like hit block with it. And I think the main benefit of the card is just to, to deal with these annoying enemies that stack 100 block and then hit you based on their block. Um, there's quite a few enemies in the game that do that. Yeah, like you're talking about new more bosses and enemies, like the um, the new the new one of the new dwarfy enemies. Yeah, it's, it could be very impactful for DT800 potentially. Pushover says, it's a big dumb attack. Um, we like big dumb attack in Obelisk Challenge. Yeah, also potentially good for twins. So like, there's, there's some good upsides, but even when you don't hit block with it, it's still an okay card that targets anyone and deals okay damage. So I think for that reason, it goes into situational. It has some potentially good upsides. There isn't really like a big downside. Next up, Shield Charge. I think I'm gonna put it in niche. I, I don't think this card is good, but very occasionally the, the slow can be useful. Um, and sometimes you do just end up with like a hundred block and you know it just does something, but... <clears throat> I find that Shield Charge is always one of the first things I want to cut on Heine. There are just other cards that I'd rather be playing, to be honest. I kind of just want to put this in Extremely Niche. I don't know, I guess the one benefit for this with its uh, dealing damage based on block is that it doesn't purge uh, your block. So you can at least do damage with it and then keep all of the block that you've gathered up. And it doesn't have like absolutely horrible ratios, I guess. I don't know. I find that like it just doesn't do nothing like 90% of the time and then like maybe 10% of the time it actually like, you know, the slow is impactful or the damage is enough to finish off the front guy or something. It's a new trap. Watch anyone with less than 20 hours a day. I know, I know, I know a lot of people like this card, but <laughs> freaking high net posters, man. It's okay, we've got some more of these cards, because every one of these freaking cards is called Shield Something. <laughs> so the next one, wait, I've already done Shield Charge, what am I talking about? Sorry, next one, Shield shield Slam. <laughs> so I think Shield's... 
Steel Slam is like, I don't know. I really don't like this card, personally. <clears throat> it's so expensive. It's so expensive, and it pressures your block. And like, on turn one, like maybe you can play like Coat of Arms and then play this, and it deals like 15 AoE damage. And then you don't have any block anymore. It's like, it doesn't feel good. It feels like, yeah, maybe if I can build a block over like f five turns, or maybe like three turns, but also in three turns, you you could just win fights by just so, I don't know. I really don't like Shield Slam as a card, personally. I do think that the, the, the yellow version, yeah, the, the yellow version does have some merit. I'm going to put it in niche strictly for the yellow upgrade, this one. Because I do genuinely think that an AoE 3 or even 4 slow, if you take plus slow, is actually crazy good. For 3 energy, that's actually, does, it doesn't matter if it doesn't deal any damage. Like, 3 cost, 4 slow, AoE is actually reasonable. Purple doesn't purge. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah, I've generally not been talking about purple cards, so that's kind of, that's crazy good, actually. Very strong. Okay, next up. Shield throw. This one, I really, I think this one is like the worst one. <laughs> I think this is the worst of these, of these block damage, damage based on block has. This one's just like, the ratio sucks. I mean, I guess it's, it's cheap, I guess, I don't know, but like, it, the ratio sucks and it gets rid of your block. Even the purple card gets rid of your block this time. Yeah, I don't really have much more to say about this. It's just kinda terrible. Alright, next up, shield wall. Shield wall goes in niche for me. Alright, let me scroll this like this. There we go. Yeah, for for the problem with shield wall, I mean it might honestly be going in extremely niche. It's not that shield wall is like bad per se, it's just too expensive. It's your entire turn, most of the time. And maybe once you hit level three, it's a little bit better. But like you can this this is a def the other defender capstone. So the defender capstones are provoke and shield wall. If this if there was like a four cost version that you could then make three costs, it could be a lot more viable. So, but yeah, I think in this general state, you don't want to take this in the early game because it's your entire turn. You don't actually help your team out at all. You just selfishly block for yourself, and then even later in the game, it's still prohibitively expensive to only block for the frontliner. So I'm actually running extremely niche. I just generally don't think this card is very good. Alright, next up, we have Siegebreaker. So I'm going to put Siegebreaker into Situational tier. Um, mainly because of its ability to apply Vulnerable more than its ability to double crack. It's not that it doubling crack is bad, it's actually insanely good at just like scaling crack to silly levels. If, especially if you can find a couple of them. But like, the card is very playable because it applies four, no, 5, 4 plus 1 and 5 plus 1 Vulnerable. Like, it's so good. So yeah, so like just from that point of view, and then yeah, so it does have the, the sort of issue where it only hits the front monster. Um, which, you know, again, that's not like amazing, but I guess the one thing that I would say that is maybe more in favor of this, like the front monster versions, is applying vulnerable to the front monster does make the front monster a lot more killable. All these other cards that hit front monster but don't actually, you know, they just deal some damage. Like they don't actually make the front monster easier to kill, whereas this does. Um, but yeah, this is a really strong late game card for just getting vulnerable up to 10 stacks on bosses where we don't worry so much about there being adds um, or we can just kill the adds and stuff or if it's like the, the last boss there isn't any adds. Um, so yeah, I think overall Siegebreaker is very good um, but it's not like absolutely exceptional so I think it's uh, situational is where it's going to be. Alright, next up we have Skull Splare. So Skull Splare is obviously a core... I can't even get up there anymore. Core card. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, Karina. Uh, I don't know where to put this. Trash. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> bin it. It's, I'm putting it in niche. I'm putting it in niche just for blue upgrade. <clears throat> I think the blue upgrade is like actually quite good. 
Skull Splits here. That's that's at the top of the list, right? Above Car, we have Skull Split. That's the only card you need. <laughs> now I'm gonna put it in niches. It, it it is a big dumb attack, right? It's a big dumb bunk. It also applies like some mark, which is like, you know, warriors don't have a lot of ways to apply mark, and it's like four mark, which is not bad. It's it's not really that bad. A nine crack is something that is like, you know, sometimes that's relevant, a lot of time it's not. Um, but yeah, overall, I think Skull Splitter is like it's it has some very limited usages. Yeah, I think it's legitimate playable in the OC, but not always great. And then you have again with five costs, it's like the perfect. Um, it's the perfect um, energy for like follow up for Magnus, for example. <clears throat> All right, Spike Ball. Spike Ball I'm gonna put into niche. Spike Ball is your school split. I actually like Spike Ball as a card. I just like I just literally had a run where I used this one, the three cost tag any monster on my tank, and it was pretty good. It's like seven thorns is a very actually a lot of thorns and is is really good early game. It deals really good damage. My only issue is just the the um yeah, obviously these ones hit front monster, which limits the viability a lot. It also has very interesting implications with um, Destroyer Gauntlets, which is like one of my favorite items. I really wish some more of these melee cards were just any monster or like less restrictive, because I I do generally think that these are playable if they, if you can hit any any card, like Bludgeon, but worse. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, overall, I think it's just it's just sort of it's an okay card. But this is the the any target one is definitely the highlight. All right, next up, Spike Shield. Spike Shield, it, it just goes in niche again for me. It's like a perfectly okay way to generate some you know a combination of block and some thorns, but it, it just it does little. It doesn't do enough. All right. Alright, Spike Shield, yeah, so Spike Shield, I, I think it's okay, I'm not going to say Spike Shield is just like bad, I just think that like, it's generally self-block cards are just always of limited effectiveness, and this this can be okay if you can put some plus thorns together, a decent amount of thorns. Um, but it's also very expensive to craft, to upgrade, which is something that I haven't really talked about a lot, but sometimes that's relevant, like sometimes you just want to upgrade Spike Shield and it's rare. Well, I don't know why it upgrades to a rare. It's not like it's some crazy card. <laughs> just, I don't. I think it would be perfectly fine for the upgrades to stay as uncommon, which would make that a little bit better too. That's that's very random. Really, I'm even talking about this at this point. I think after like doing this for two hours or something, I've gone crazy. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so it's 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 okay. And sometimes I play it. Most of the time, I'm not trying to look for it in the draft. Okay, next up, Steel Skin. Um, I actually think Steel Skin. <sighs> Um, I'm gonna put in situational. I actually think steel steel skin. If you compare it to spike shield, which we just did, it's it gives it a lot more bang for its buck in terms of actually defensive stats. Like you get like a decent amount of block. You get some shield for next turn. You get some reinforce if they pierce through it. The only issue with steel skin is that this this specific um, upgrade is terrible. <laughs> it's literally garbage. In OC because you cannot get more than like three or four fortify at most, and most of the time your fort maximum amount of fortify is like two. So this is now a two cost gain four block, four shield, two reinforce for two energy, which is just like it's not very good. So yeah, unfortunately sometimes you're gonna see this steel skin upgrade and feel really sad. But yeah, if you do need a little bit of extra self blocking in the early game, which is reasonable, steel skin is a very good pickup. Um, so for that, I'm gonna put it in situational. Okay, next up, we got Stockade. <clears throat> so, Stockade, if I can get there, is a core card for me. Um, Stockade is very impactful. Um, it's sort of like a barricade. Like, it's like a little bit better barricade. I mean, base is sort of just like the same as barricade. Um, the Thorns is actually very relevant in the early game. Um, like applying eight or like five, six, if you have plus one, eight or nine thorns to your entire team, 
actually really hurts enemies. Um, it's just a very, very solid card overall. And then sometimes you'll get the yellow upgrade, uh, which gives you, you know, also a little bit of vitality, which is also very nice for just doing a little bit of chip healing and keeping your team healthy. Um, Stockade, you'll see it in the draft as both Guardian and Warlord Capstone cards. So you're going to be seeing upgrade. You're going to generally be seeing the upgraded version of Stockade in the draft, which is either of these two. So I'm going to put a little bit less impact on the fact that the base card is not like as good. Both of these cards are very, very, very strong. Um, so yeah, I think I'm very, very, very happy to see a Stockade in my Capstone card pick. And I will take it. I wouldn't take it over Push Forward. Um, but it's probably my second go-to card um, in the Capstone slot. It's the reason you pick Warlord, yes. Yeah, it is a very good reason to pick Warlord, which is oftentimes, like, decent, but not amazing, just so that you can have a chance of seeing Stockade, which is, like, interesting. Alright, next up, we've got Sundarama. Um, I think Sundarama, for me... I'm going to put it in situational. I think it's sort of in between these two. I think the blue upgrade is, like, obviously... I I think blue if blue upgrades um, was, like, the only version, it would be in generally strong, or maybe even core, but, like, I don't like these versions very much. Um, because, again, like, front monster target access is not the best. Um... Yeah. It is, it is a very expensive way to apply Vulnerable, comp if you compare it to something like just playing um, Intimidates. But oftentimes you need at least a card, you know, a sort of bigger source of Vulnerable at some point. It's just equal to Siege Breaker. Yeah, it's, it's sort of similar to Siege Breaker. It's a lot easier to see in the early game as well. Um, and yeah, so I think it's sort of an unremarkable... Like, damage-wise, it's unremarkable, and, like, the only reason you play this card is for the vulnerable, obviously. Um, and it, it is an expensive way to do that in the early game. It is craftable for M16, yeah, because this is an uncommon card. Yeah, I think in OC, it's decent. Alright, next up, Sweeping Strike. So I think Sweeping Strike goes into... Uh, situational here. Um, I think it's, it's, it's just another decent early game option to hit any enemies, uh, or, or sorry, any target you want. Yeah, with this weird thing where you get to do a tiny little bit of damage to some targets on the sides. It's sort of like slightly better than Cleave, because it does more damage to the primary target, but then a little bit worse. Uh, just dealing AoE, but yeah, I don't know. I don't mind taking it because it does allow me to hit any target I want, and I guess for things like Grickly, it procs his weapon three times, which is like a very niche plus point to it, but you can apply two bleed to some people. <laughs> I don't know, for me it's slightly worse Precise Strike. Um, I'd rather just be playing Precise Strike for to get all the damage onto the single target that I want to kill. Debuff Evasion. Yeah, that, it is true that sometimes like, having target size just do things like Clear Evasion, do that tiny list, little bit of damage to a stealth enemy and stuff like it sometimes has value and oftentimes it just deals a tiny bit so i think i'm gonna put in situation i think it's like an okay card to get early and then you probably want to be cutting it on and like layer run down the run thousand needles i think i'm gonna put it in niche my general opinion on thorns build in obelisk challenge is um they're very item reliant and that sort of makes every most of the thorn stuff just niche by default because you sort of relying on items to really get a strong late game thorns going unless you're playing with yager of course in which case yager is yager but i'm not going to consider that right now because he is slated to be getting changed um yeah very very solid I mean, it's just literally just spike shield but it costs more and has more stats so i'm we already talked about that it's it does what it does and yeah let's move on to throw bowlers yeah, it can be quite good in Act 1 just to deal a bunch of damage. Especially the yellow version. So from that for that point of view, it's quite good. Alright, so Throw Bowlers, um, I'm going to be putting as a call card. I think Throw Bowlers is actually crazy good. Bowlers is so strong. I, I kind of actually, like, 
tell you how impactful like Shackle is as a mechanic. Like just getting to basically take two turns in a row against a high and and uh, so that you can kill a high priority target with bolt because of bowlers is crazy. It also deals really good damage. It's not just like you know it just you're using it just for the shackle. The damage is good. Like the the shackle is crazy. It purges evasion. It the chain is still is really relevant and like you can shackling two enemies out of four. Yeah, I, I it took me a while to warm up to this card, but it's it's insane. And the other thing about bowlers is it's it's a commander capstone. So the two commander capstones are push forward and throw bowlers, both of which are some of the best cards that you can draft. And the commander pack in general is one of the best uh, packs to draft for a tank. So you're almost always taking commander, and then from that you're almost always getting push forward or throw bowlers. So commander is just insanely strong. It's by far the best pack in that you can draft in the game. Like I don't think there's an equal. So, yeah, Bowler's absolutely nuts. Moving on to other insane cards. Welcome to the, the Core Club, Timefall. This card actually got, like, recently nerfed just a little bit. It's absolutely fucking broken still. This, is, this card is insanely broken. <laughs> it's so broken. Like, 0.75 health, guaranteed innate card. It's just... 70, you know, it's, it's basically at least 75 damage, if not more, on a monster. Yeah, it's a time for, like, it just, it just does so much damage. And when you're talking in the context of Mortal Strike, right, so Mortal Strike does, like, the, the yellow upgrade does, like, 52 damage, I think, for 5 energy. This does 1 to 1 with your health. And if you're playing a warrior and you find, like, some plus health item, and you take to plus 10 health, like, this deals 130 for 5 energy. Like, it's not close. It's just stupid. It's just, it's, it's just <laughs> if you find this in in your random pack in your in your draft, you just click you click it, you click it every time. Honestly, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna put it here. I'm not judging cards. I'm not placing them in the tiers because like that would be way too much effort. But yeah, I, I this will go to the top. This is this is the best warrior card in the game, um for Obelisk Challenge specifically. Like you just you take it. Like it's an instant click. It doesn't matter what it comes with in the random pack, you click the random pack if you see Timefall because it wins you the game. It's such, especially this one. This is a guaranteed, we delete one enemy from every fight for the first two, like, act and a half. Like, on turn one, you just kill a guy. Do I think vulnerable removal would balance it? Maybe. It would definitely make it more fair. Because, like, yeah, it's like, right now it's like a 100 plus damage nuke, and if you don't kill them, they're also vulnerable. You have put a bunch of vulnerable stacks on them. The, the, the issue is that it's a 100 plus damage nuke, you know, or in this case, it's an 80 damage nuke. To, and at that point, it doesn't matter how much energy it costs if you can play it. You know, if this costs 6 energy, I would play the card because I don't need to block if I just remove their highest, their their biggest threat from, from the game in one turn. I'm gonna move on to Torment of Thorns now. Yeah, I think this just goes in niche. It's an okay card. It requires you to have a buttload of thorns to be relevant, but it is a good way to scale your thorns. So if you can get to 50 or 100 thorns, it's a good way to sort of make it better. It's a bit weird because this one is definitely the most impactful one, the blue version, but it's also the one that like removes all your thorns, so it's a bit like weird. It's sort of like a finishing move. Yeah, but it also applies bleed, so you're, you're getting like a little bit more than that. The corrupted version, interestingly enough, is actually insane. This is one of the best corrupt corruption upgrades that you can get. Not in terms of like it's the best one of the best cards, but in terms of the amount of power that the corruption adds, this is crazy. It's like it goes to 1.5 times and doesn't purge your block, so suddenly it's like, you know, it's it's so much better. Oh, sorry, it doesn't purge your thorns, it's so much better. So maybe if you find a couple of these, you can you can sort of, you know purposely and you have a decent thorns build purposely go to the corrupted altar and try and corrupt them but yeah otherwise than that it's just it's sort of a niche card and honestly if you can get to the point where you're stacking enough thorns to make this card good you're probably already winning the game from just having that much thorn stack so it's it sort of remains niche transfusion yeah transfusion is a little bit of a weird card it's sort of like blood for blood but it doesn't deal any damage and in theory, you can steal bleeding from one of your, or from someone, and get it back yourself for some self-bleeding 
shenanigans, but like that's just so unbelievably niche in Obelisk Challenge where you have no guarantees on anything. Maybe there's some crazy self self bleed deck that's happening in Adventure by Dalit. But yeah, I think overall transfusion is just like I put it in niche because it is a way to deal with self bleed. It's a short term way. It's an easy way. It's a zero cost way for Grookly to be like, hey. I don't have an, an answer to all this self bleed that I'm getting from my fury. Um, you know, if you don't find enough blood for bloods or you don't have any dispel available or anything like that. So from that point of view, it's very niche, but at least like it has some kind of value, like where it can, you know, cause self bleed can just a point where you're just killing yourself in longer fights, you know, well, I guess it's very minimal. It's, it's basically just blood for blood. Oh, well, maybe, maybe should have blood for blood shouldn't be in generally strong. <laughs> The point is in niche and it's, in, it's like the same card. Fuck, that doesn't make any sense. You know what, whatever. I, I don't make sense. But I should figure this out. Let me go back to it. Alright, change change of plan. Change of plan. Although this is a good card to troll your teammates with. I never realized that. Is it any... Give, give one of your allies all of your bleed. Bring my mind. Yeah, Ataku comes in with the vengeance. Why is Blood for Blood generally strong? That's true. It's true. You know what? All right, we're gonna put them both in situational. I'll put them in situational because all right, here is my full justification for this now. And now that I've thought about it a little bit more, and I've now that I've got more cards in place, and we've kind of a better understanding of why we're putting cards in certain tiers. Grookly needs an, a self-bleed answer. Um, both of these cards are self-bleed answers. If you have... If you have... Um, already have a self-bleed answer, Transfusion is basically useless. Um, and Blood for Blood loses a lot of value too. So, yeah, it doesn't make sense that they're in generally strong, actually. That, that's, that's stupid. <laughs> so, Ataka was right. He, he's he's right. He's the man. But I do think them being a situational sphere because if you don't have any self bleed answers on Grookly, like ex killing yourself with bleed is it can be game losing. So yeah, having something that available that is a self bleed answer is very strong. And obviously, if you have got a ton of self bleed, it's not like transfusion and blood for better blah bad. They're actually pretty good. Transfusion maybe being almost bad because the oak rays you're more likely to see. Um, allow you to just transfer it to a monster um, for zero energy, which is pretty nice. Warpaint. Alright, we're gonna move into Warpaint here. <clears throat> Warpaint, I'm just gonna put into the situational tier. It's an... You know, it's just a little support card that gives you a little bit of extra damage. The one cost is, like, quite nice. Sometimes, if you can have the extra energy, or you're playing Bree, where you get a discount on skills, where you can make it four energy. Uh, sorry, uh, just draw one for zero, and it cycles itself. Um, obviously, if you have plus one powerful stacks, this gets a little better as well. So I think Warpaint, the only one I don't really like is this blue version, because it, it's it's a card that becomes innate, but it doesn't do very much on turn one. And I think it's really important for you to try and find your most impactful cards on turn one. So having a card that takes up one of your five draws sort of makes it really bad. But it's pretty easy to avoid this card if you do see it. Um, I think if you just we just sort of maybe pretend this doesn't exist, <laughs> it, it's definitely weak. I'd probably put this wall paint into like the extremely niche tier, but the all the other versions of the cat are very good. Um, well, they're okay. Words, they're not very good, but they are good and they do what they set out to do. So I think it's a good card. And we got two left. Let's go. All right, whirlwind. I'm gonna put whirlwind in situational. I don't know. The, the thing about Whirlwind is I think that this specific upgrade is very good, and I think like the base Whirlwind is extremely unimpactful a lot of the time for 6 energy. Yeah, if you have ways, like for example with Grookly, if you can duplicate it, or yeah, if you can use Nez to make it cost 0, all it, and it does scale really well, but like, a lot of the times I find in Obelisk Challenge, Whirlwind is a case where either it kills everybody and you're really happy with it, or it doesn't kill anybody and you'd much rather have just played a, a card that dealt the same amount of damage to one target for way less energy and then hitting them with another card that actually deals damage to them like dealing 24 damage 
to all enemies is a lot worse than dealing 40 damage to one enemy, which is, you know, and you're probably dealing more even more than that with six energy. So maybe it's niche. I don't know. I feel like maybe it's niche. I actually struggle to make this card work a lot. You know, I'm going to drop it down to niche. I'm going to put it into niche because I think it kind of requires a lot to go right. And also, even if you do have the scaling, like let's say, for example, you have Grinding Wheel, very obviously, but then you now got Grinding Wheel, which costs like three or four energy to play, and then you've got a Whirlwind, which costs six or seven, or maybe five or six with discounts. So, like, it's just very expensive. And then, like, if you have a small deck, you're getting the card back next turn, and you can't play it anymore because it costs five or six still. Yeah, I completely agree. The Carnage is just much more, much more accessible. And I think from that, like comparing it to Carnage and Devastate, um, it's it should be in the niche tier. It's definitely a why I consider niche. Yeah, it's only good in team fights. There are so many other cards that are way better against single targets than this one. So yeah, I think niche is a good thing. All right, the last card, the last card, Wrecking Ball. Wrecking Ball. I want to like this card. I did a like when in my early, early times of playing this game, I did a run with Wrecking Ball on Grickly, and I was, early, this was low Madness Adventure, and then I was killing things with it, and I was like, yo, Wrecking Ball's so good! <laughs> it's, 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 I don't know, it's a card. It has, it's basically the exact same issues with Whirlwind, but it doesn't even hit multiple times. I don't know, I, do I just put it here? Is it an extremely niche card? I don't know, it just feels like it does so little. For the cost, the only upside is that it does hit everything guaranteed, which means it has certain niche uses against stealth. Maybe that's a, no. Okay, let me let me let me. Where where the hell did I put cleave? I put cleave in situational. All right, how about this? We'll move it up, and we'll move cleave down. <laughs> I don't know why why it justified that, but I don't think cleave is a situation. I think cleave is is kind of on the crappy side. And if you just compare like cleave like cleaves like seven damage for two and then wrecking ball is seven damage for two and so it's like sort of the same card so yeah this is our um the, the final version of the talus we made a few changes as we went out and we sort of understood maybe like well we want to put cards in different niches a little bit better or different tiers i actually think that i'm quite happy with the way this turned out there's actually the exact same amount of cards in situational and niche. Um, and then there's almost the same amount of cards in core and extremely niche. Which I think is quite cool. It means that, you know, I think a lot of the cards in the game do have some value. Um, even if some of them are more, you know, some of them are obviously cards we want to play almost every run. And sometimes we're just sort of chilling a little bit. And <clears throat> I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm also really sweaty. Fucking hell, it's really hot in Canada today. Alright guys, so that was the list. Uh, thank you so much for watching the video. Let me know in the comments if there's any sort of spicy takes you have, any cards you disagree with. Do you agree with me putting Carnage? I mean, eventually I put it into situational, but initially I put it in niche. You know. But yeah, so I'm going to be doing this. We're going to be going through all of the sets of cards, so look out for future videos. Um, for Scout, Mage, and Healers. But yeah, that's it for the video. Thanks everyone for hanging out, and yeah, hopefully we'll see you in the next one.